again to another episode of Heavy in the Bay. Gerald Brown here, and it's an honor and a privilege. I'm going to start it off right off the bat and giving this gentleman his flowers and his accolades, a read as follow, an NBA champion, <laughs> an NCAA champion, because March Madness is here. He yeah. played on the team that I'm going to get into. The question is, were they perhaps the most talented of those Kentucky Wildcats team, the legendary man himself? A is okay, Mr. Derek <laughs> Andrews joining me. DA, nothing but love. Appreciate you, man. Uh, March Madness is here. Dan, what are some of your fondest memories around this time of the year as a player, getting first and foremost, going into conference tournament, and then knowing, you know, what was at stake to play for uh, for the NCAA tournament? Uh, it was like one of those legacy things that you have as a kid. You just kind of look at it and be like, man, I love to be in that environment. Uh, we loved it so much, we cut our heads, uh, shaved our heads and went bald. Like we were so gung ho about getting into the to the SEC tournament and going to the championship into the NCAA that we were just like, man, this is legendary what we could do. So it's a memorable thing. Uh, I remember uh, Sam Newton said it. He said, the older you get, the more you'll appreciate the tournament. And he was right. Like you see it now, he's like, man, we was a part of something special. And you always kind of relive those moments. So the NCAA tournament and the SEC tournament, all that stuff still matters to me. I love it. It's the best time of the year. Yeah, when you look at college basketball now, and, and, and you know, we would just talk about this off air. You played on a team that, you know, obviously Kentucky and Big Blue Nation, you know, so much history there, you know. And you look at that team that had nine NBA players on that. If we were in today's game, how many of those guys do you think, how many of you guys would have probably stayed together without jumping into the transfer portal to go somewhere else? Uh, I think because, like you said, the landscape of how it is now, I think probably might have been two guys stay, maybe three if you're lucky. Uh, the rest would have been looking for money and, and not caring about the win factor. And and it's because the system set them up that way. You know, when back then the system didn't set us up. The system said you can get the best from your bang, uh going to where you know you can play and be seen. You know, once you knew that you wanted to showcase your game, you wasn't worried about the money of the NBA. You knew it would come because of your work you put in. Now it's almost like they don't care about the work as much because the system said, hey, go get paid wherever you can and don't worry about nothing else. And, you know, I still think it's the adults problem that they created because the kids are doing what kids do. I want to get money, you know, but the adults allowed this to happen. So now the game has lost its, its love and some of the players have lost his love because they're chasing the dollar and not the fun of it. So it's a big situation. It's a bad situation, uh, but it's still March Madness. And I don't care who you are. Once you get between that court, you're still going to play. Yeah, when, when you look at the game now, and, and, and obviously, you know, it's funny because I was telling somebody recently, you know, I think this might be one of the first years or few years that if you ask somebody who is the best player in college basketball for men, you probably <laughs> have so many different answers. Yeah. But yeah. then if I said, who's Caitlin Clark, we would instantly know all oh, the young lady that plays out at Iowa. When yeah. you look at the landscape of basketball at the college level, I think it's a major problem. How yeah. do you see this overall, the state of college basketball? Uh, all athletics too, but the college state of basketball is you need to get a control of the NIL and you get to get a control where transfer portal. Like, you know, if I transfer once, I had to sit out and then that was it. Now you can just go because you're in a bad mood. You had a bad game. Now you don't get paid as much. Now you're not leaving – the sense of pride or integrity, you're leaving just because, you know, and then if you're leaving once, I get it. I seen one kid left, like, I think it's his fourth school in four years. And it's like, well, what is he getting out of there? Obviously you're not good enough to stay. You don't want to develop anywhere. You don't want to build a relationship. What is the point? And I think until we control the transfer portal and control the NIL, NIL better, uh, I think you're going to have this problem and you're going to look at it. And you're going to be like, the reason why you don't know who's the best player, because one kid was really good at one school, then he goes to another school, and now he's back average because he has to fall in line. Uh, you can look at the one of the best players in, in college basketball is a JUCO kid from Tennessee. You know, he came on the scene because he left JUCO. He wasn't transferring all over. He came from JUCO and played. Now imagine if he leaves this year and goes to another school and he has to sit back and doesn't play as well. Now you're like, well, what happened to him? You know, it's like it's it's a situation where a lot of guys are being lost because of the transfer portal too. So. If you don't, if the adults don't fix it, it's going to get worse. Kids are going to be leaving and quitting 
and spending money riding around school and Rolls Royces and gonna be ineligible. <laughs> it's gonna be crazy. How how do you you know you're a Louisville native, Louisville, Kentucky native, and you know the story recently they dismissed their head coach and longtime uh player uh Kenny Payne, who also is assistant coach at University of Kentucky. And one of the things is aside from just getting reaction, but how do you think you can be able to coach in this climate and develop mm -hmm. fundamentals in this climate? Because I don't think you can, DA, where, you know, you got to cater so much to the kids. Well, I disagree. I disagree with the, the teaching part, but I think right. the holding the holding on part is right. But the teaching part should never change. If I catch the ball and I don't find the seams ready to triple threat and attack and see the floor, that's coaching. It has nothing to do with how much money you made or anything. You teach that all day long. So instead of making them run suicides, what you do is you teach them a game. If the ball, if I pass the ball, what does their defender normally do? He ball watches, cut back door. That doesn't matter if he's an NIO, he makes a million dollars or he makes a dollar. That's simple teaching. You teach your job and you let the outside stuff happen after the fact. And I think that's the big problem in college basketball is, is a lot of these coaches don't care about teaching more than they care about anything else. And like you said, they got to worry about the NIL stuff. But if you got me on campus, I'm there. Now it's time to focus on that. After his campus is the reason why Nick Saban retired. He don't want to deal. He said he said he retired after the championship game. He didn't say during the season. He said after the season, I realized these guys are worried about playing time and money instead of just the loss, and we're gonna get better. I understand that. And I think when you're in season, you still have to teach the game. So I think this young generation of coaches and new generation of coaches need to understand that if you don't teach the game, the product is going to lose. So the NIL is going to lose because a lot of fans I've seen, you've seen some of the Louisville fans that don't show up to the game. Yeah. They don't and, even, and that's show the problem. Up. Yeah. That's a you got to teach the game. And so you, your product is somewhat good in order to get the money for NIL in order to get better players. Yeah. Well, I mean, Go a deep for go a step further and a, a level down to the AAU level. When you look at the um, AAU level, what are your thoughts of the AAU level in this in this climate right now? I've been telling people for decades it's terrible. I got into it to help. I taught our kids how to play, but some of the kids' parents want them to go to different schools. They jump ship. They don't want to develop. They want to do anything. And now they're coming back. Oh, I see what you were saying. I said I play in the NBA. I'm telling you what they're at. They're looking for. They're looking for smart kids. Who, who are coachable. They're not looking for a kid who can score 30. He's got 30 of those on his recruiting list. He don't need a kid to score 30. So the AAU is a problem. I asked this one coach, I said, why are you pressing at age fifth and sixth grade? I said, they don't even know how to get a defensive stance. You know what the coach said? I'm just trying to win. Mm. So therefore, they're letting you know they don't care about developing the kids. And then here's the parents' number one flaw. I want to be seen. I want to be on the circuit. Your kid is not good yet. Get him good and they'll come get him from the circuit. Parents don't want to hear that. So, the, again, the adults are the issue. It's like you can't get these AAU coaches and AAU parents to wake up and see your kid doesn't understand how to play. He's not going to be smart enough. He's not going to be skilled enough. And he's not going to be athletic enough to get by once you get to your junior, senior in high school. So, to me, it's like if you don't get the parents and the AAU kid, the people on the same play uh, playing field, it's not going to work. It's, it's going backwards. You see the less talent every year. You see a kid can't even make a bounce pass. Remember what Coach Patino just said? He took his whole season to get a bounce pass. Now, what was all these high school and AAU coaches teaching? Not that. <laughs> so yeah. it's getting it's getting worse. And, and, and when you look at the whole situation where kids, you know, what about a kid that's not on the EYBL, the Nike, or the shoe circuit? That it's almost lost. But then also, it's a trickle down effect from the transfer portal. Where mm -hmm. I had a coach yeah. in Chicago. A good friend of mine, Gary DeCesa, basically said he was having a hard time getting a kid a Division One scholarship that scored 2,000 points because mm -hmm. the fact is coaches are saying they got to get kids out of the transfer portal. Yep. They're not really recruiting high school kids because high school mm -hmm. kids get you fired. when you, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. How do you fix this, DA? How do, how do you fix this, especially at the grassroots level where, again, if you if you know if your son was old enough to play, let's say high school basketball right now, what mm -hmm. advice would you what how would you navigate and what advice would you have for him? Would it be playing for one of these teams or would it just be focusing focusing on fundamentals? Focusing on fundamentals because your game is gonna bring people. The kid who had average had two thousand points, does he know how to play basketball? Because you can go to a smaller school and then they'll recruit you then. The kids don't want to work. The parents want to speed up the process. They want to ignore the fact that your kid 
maybe need to work a little bit more. They want to ignore that. But again, if you don't start with the transfer portal up the system, it's just like the government. If you don't start from the top and it funnels down, it's not going to change. So if you stop all the transfer portal, those kids are going to be there for three years. They're there. You know what I mean? If you say, hey, you can only go to the NBA here. You can only transfer once. You can do this. Now, guess what? You know when you recruit, this kid is going to be here three or four years. Now you can get another freshman, develop him, and then he's there another two, three years. So if you don't stop the transfer portal, you're not going to stop this problem at the grassroots levels because all the AAU kids are gravitating to what everybody else is doing. How can I get the most money? I'm going to jump on a team over here. I'm going to jump on this team. I'm going to switch this team, and they never develop. And then all of a sudden, they're seniors. They're like your guy said, I can't get my guy a look because of the system. And then you got other players who the coaches aren't recruiting. But if you know how to play, coaches will find you. I mean, like I said, the best player, like one of the best players in the SEC right now, the best top players – it's two freshmen in Kentucky and the Tennessee guy. So don't you can't say it's not freshmen are like are not coming. They're coming, but again, it's the high school kids that are suffering and all them guys because of the system is saying, hey, I can't recruit everybody because I got to recruit uh, transfer portals. If you don't stop the transfer, you ain't gonna win. When's the last time you seen a fundamentally sound NBA player, maybe a young NBA player that you looked and said, wow, that 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 young man's fundamentally sound. Yeah, it's been a minute. It's been a minute because they're watching YouTube videos instead of games. Like when kids say, man, Michael Jordan ran that good. I asked him, when, have you ever watched a full game of him? No, nah, but I saw his highlights. <laughs> it's, like, <laughs> it's like, dude, you don't even study the game. So if you look at an NBA player, he's not studying a full game like we did. We would dissect every game. TNT games, the player, we would be dissecting. We were like, oh, look at him. Watch that screen. We would dissect the game. They dissect highlights which you know doesn't show you the full game of how to set a back screen, how to slip a screen, reading the defenses. They're all about watching shortness and relying on athleticism. So you see Hallenberg, some of them guys that are really good, smart players, but how many times have they jab, step, pass, fake, cut through, swim, stroke, get through a screen, like all those little things that we had to do to be great. Like they didn't, they don't see that. So it's not their fault. It's like I said, it's the leadership. So I haven't seen a great smart player in a long time uh, I think the big, the smartest player I've seen in a while is Jokic. I think he's the most smart player, but he, of course, he played overseas. Um, he played since he was younger. He probably had people teach him. He realized he can't dunk over the, over the rim, jump over the rim. But I just think you see some of those guys like that, man, are really, really intelligent because they've been trained over a period of time. Our kids are getting neglected with getting trained the right way, and that's why our kids aren't, aren't looking as good. And they're great players. Our kids in the United States are great players. But because they're not getting proper training, they look like they don't know how to play at times. Yeah. When you, when you look at the NBA and uh, recently, uh, Joe Dumas, who works with the NBA, has really indicated, as well as Commissioner Adam Silver, talked about possibly making some adjustments to curb this, this scoring. When you're getting guys scoring 73 points, 200 <laughs> points in an all-star game. And maybe sort of finding out ways. And I, you know, I was doing a show with Eddie Johnson one one uh, time a couple weeks back, and he mentioned mm -hmm. about hand checking. Yo, it was brutal. How, how much of a hand checking implemented in today's game? How big of a shock would you think it would be? And how long do you think it would take for most players to adjust to playing a, a more of a physical style of basketball? Or yet, better yet, defense. We would lose ratings so fast because guys would get kicked out for flopping and for crying. Derek Harper grabbed my wrist, my hips, and guided me all the way up the court to where he wouldn't let me run a play. Hand checking. I had to realize I had to step back and speed pass. These guys would be smacking their arm. They'd be like flopping, throwing a falling out of bounds. So it would be a bad situation if you try to implement that right now because they don't know any better. If you implemented it before they got to the NBA a little bit and kind of eased them into it, but right now if you did that, the way these dudes fuss about a foul right now, like when I get elbow like this, they'll be they'll fall out, look like they've been shot with a 12 game. But now I think it's you you can't implement that right now. You have to do that in a different era, like summer league, high a college, get it back in college where it's a little more physical. Uh, even in college when we play, you know, we was grabbing each other. When I was pressing, I would grab your whole arm before you took off running. Ref didn't say nothing. <laughs> so now it's just you couldn't do that now in the NBA. These guys can't adjust to that. They've been, like I said, they've been trained to get away with the flopping because the referees bought into it instead of referees saying, nah, think about it. They had to put an implementation in a rule book for flopping. Think about that. So hand checking? No, you can't implement that stuff right now. Yeah. When you go back to the NCAA tournament, you know, obviously March Madness is here. When you look at 
you know, your alma mater, the Kentucky Wildcats. What has really impressed you about this young team? Uh, just their heart and their grittiness. Uh, they're out there playing hard, man. They, you know, like when you look at some of the plays, the stuff that they've, they've done, those plays are not drawn up. Those kids are being smart. They say, hey, this guy's overplaying me. Let me run and get a split and get this. They're not relying on plays. They're relying on basic basketball instinct because everybody's scouting them. Most teams that just run stuff and they're like, man, it didn't work. Well, now what? You know what I mean? Like you have to improvise mentally. And those guys, those young freshmen and some of the guys we have on our team, they're starting to be really smart players and they're figuring it out. And again, it's not the play. It's just them understanding basketball. And I think that's why we look a lot better now. Those kids we got now, they whoever taught them in high school and, and AAUs, whoever they coaches were, they taught them a lot by the time they got to college. So that's really helped them play now. Yeah, you're talking about obviously Dillingham. I think – DJ Shepard, yeah, yeah, yeah. Stuff guys that taught them, yeah. yeah, old school guys, <laughs> yeah, definitely the old school guys, old school you guys. know. Uh, DA, before I let you get on out of here, and, and we always appreciate your time, man. And I, I, I couldn't let this interview uh end without talking about the fact that the matter is acts of kindness because you know what, DA, time and time again, we see so much negativity. That's uh, really on, on center stage in our society and stuff. Talk about acts of kindness and what made you come up with this uh, this idea and this movement. Well, I came up when I grew up that the only way people would help you if you had a good attitude. So if I had a good attitude, I would say, hey, hello, ma'am or sir. They'd be like, hey, yeah, you can get this job. I didn't have to have a degree. I didn't have to have anything. I had to have manners. And I say, well, imagine if the world only paid you if you had a good attitude. You know how many broke people would be out there? But everybody's willing to just give money, just like foundation people. I watch all these billionaires give money away, but you haven't changed the character of a kid. You haven't changed the character of a community, but you won't change character. That don't work that way. So I said, I want to change what I'm doing. So if I'm helping you, you got to be a better person. So I said, everything is A-OK is when you do your part, I do mine. So I just felt like it was a good way of getting some of these people and parents and kids to say, if you won't help, you got to change your attitude to be a better person. And I think that that leaves more to other people saying, oh, man, that's a good day. Because if you say, hey, how you doing today? And open the door for me, I'm like, man, that was a good person. But if you slam the door in my face, now I got an attitude all day. You know what I mean? So I think the effect that you can have on other people is significant. And we just need to recognize that more. Do you think you found your calling in, in terms of just uh, relaying these messages? And obviously, the very inspirational book, your book, St uh, Stamina, about your life story. And obviously... Yeah speaking engagements and stuff. Do you feel like mm -hmm. you've called, you found your, your calling? I found part of it. Um, but like I coached uh, the, the national team last year in Costa Rica. I've coached at the G League this past summer. I've Congrats. coached at different places. Yes, yeah, so I've coached and I've been getting opportunities. And someone will say, well, man, does he have experience? I'm like, I've got the experience, but people won't hire you to use it there. Then I open my foundation up and then I'm getting a calls from basketball. So it's like you don't know which one are you getting called to do? Like I've been doing my foundation for years. So uh, I feel like I got half and half of my calling. I just don't know how to put them together uh, to get them yet together. But uh, I'm working on it, man. And uh, I just love what I do. I love helping other people in basketball, life. Uh, and it's a good thing, man. I, I'm a pro I'm happy for what I do. And I'm, I'm glad that I'm able to do it. What was that moment playing in that championship game? Was it the nerves? Was it nervousness leading up to that game or was there a sense of confidence? Because, again, you went through a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why I think the the, the, the the title of the book, Stamina, you know, mm -hmm. the ACL tear and all this other stuff right. out there. Was it just really a sense of relief or just what was that emotion like playing in that championship game? Well, I've always played and I play with control aggression. And what that means is like when you play, you play smart, but you play hard. And for me, like, no matter when I got hurt, I'd never changed my mentality. Like a lot of people were like, well, man, how'd you do it? Like I tore ACLs back in four months. I tore another ACLs back in, in three months or five months and then three months. And people like take a whole year off. I'm like, what was they doing? It was a mental thing. They couldn't get over the injury. It's like, man, I don't know if I can do that. So I never was afraid of playing the, the same way. Mental aggression. I was always that way. So when I got into the championship game, it was like, this is what I do. I play hard and I play smart and that's it. And I think anytime you do those things and you understand the game and you understand playing hard, I mean, that's it. Like Rick Pitino gave me the compliment, most best compliment ever. He said, I didn't have to yell at DA because if I told him something, he did it. Mm -hmm. And he played every possession like it was his last, which I did because I like, I don't know how this career is going to go. I didn't know if I was going to make the NBA with two ACLs. So I wasn't worried about that. I was worried about playing in a game. And I was like, this is fun. So uh, I always looked at myself as just playing the same way, man. It, 
uh, mentality of uh, controlled aggression. And if people do that when they play at, well, athletes control themselves in that way and control your emotions, you can get the best volume out of your game. So I was never fair, fearful of anything. Uh, I always played the same way, never did not play the same way. And I play with a smile. I ain't one of these dudes all tough and frown. They don't do nothing. You're going to get dunked on like everybody. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you, you know, you, you're part of a select group to be able to have an NCAA, win an NCAA championship as well as an NBA championship. When you look back on your basketball journey, uh, what, what, how do you sum it up on your basketball journey? I didn't do it for fame. I did it for fun. So my journey was great. Like people would be like, man, I don't even know who he is. I made millions of dollars, had all the championships. I had a great run. So I don't look for fame. I look for the fun and I lived in my moment. Some guys be like, man, I miss it. I don't miss that. I mean, I'm the fun I had. I remember relive. Like I look at our videos. I look at our games. I'm like, man, I had a great time. This is, this is amazing. Like I enjoyed what I did. And I think that's the difference. People are looking for fame and I'm looking for fun. And I was fortunate enough to get both, but man, it's, it's the greatest feeling in the world to go back and look at your videos and say, man, we did some amazing stuff. Like I don't wake up tired, hurt, feet, the body don't hurt no more. Like, <laughs> so I was, it's just great, man. It's uh, I've known some guys who had way more money than me, but they never had the success or fun like I did. So I'm grateful. Yeah, definitely. And DA, you know what? I think that it's just a matter of time. The right mm -hmm. situation comes along that you on somebody's sideline. If you had your choice, pros or college? College, for sure. College, college. I don't mind the pros, but I know college, I can teach a kid to think. I can teach him to enjoy the game, teach him to love the game, and teach him to be able to help his family and, and himself at that age. And pros, I don't mind it, but a lot of you might only get one or two guys. In college, I can affect a lot more to me because they haven't been completely, you know, engulfed into fame yet. They got a little bit, but they don't have all that money and fame. And I think college would be great for me. But I, I mean, if I can get to the pros, that'd be great. And, uh, just making an impact on the game, too. I would love to do that. Yeah, definitely. Listen, DA, always, man, appreciate always, you. Yeah. And definitely, man, all the best to you and the family. And look, Thank we got to get real soon. Appreciate yes, it. Yes, sir. Anytime, my man. He is the legendary NCAA champion, NBA champion, Eric Anderson.